Today, we are going to compare and contrast the respective approach of the English and Malaysian law of contract towards undue influence as a visiting factor. So, undue influence is basically a case where a contract has been entered as a result of pressure which falls short of amounting to duress. The party subject to the pressure may have a cause of action in equity to have the contract set aside on the grounds of undue influence. Undue influence is defined in the case of National Commercial Bank Jamaica and Hugh 2003 as it is a ground in which equity would intervene to give redress where there has some been some unconscionable conduct on the part of the defendant. This doctrine involves two elements. Firstly, there must be a relationship capable of giving rise to the necessary influence and secondly, the influence generated by the relationship must have been abused. And in the case of Davies and AIB Group, it stated that undue influence does not protect against the folly, but only against victimization and that it has a connotation of impropriety. So there's two types of undue influence. Firstly, it's an actual undue influence and presumed undue influence. Actual undue influence is known as the class 1 undue influence and equity gave relief on the ground of undue influence where the party have induced the other party to enter into a transaction by actual, undue, by actual pressure which is regarded as improper but it does not amount to the rest and this kind of other influence can be exercised without making illegitimate threats based on the case of Borel and Ting or any threats at all In the case of William and William illustrate how an actual undue influence is like In this case, a father has been threatened by the bank to repay a sum which the son has somehow cheated and if the father don't pay the bank threatened to prosecute the son so ended up the father finding this case as regarded as undue influence and tried to avoid the category is presumed undue influence it's divided into class 2a and class 2b in the case of class 2a it applies to parent and the child guardian and ward or even religious advisor and the disciple doctor patient solicitor and client or However, class 2A do not apply to husband and wife as proven in the case of Bank of Montreal and Stuart and this class also does not apply to all relationships which are fiduciary in the sense that they give rise to a duty of disclosure and the presumption may apply even if the relationship has ceased if the influence continues Class 2B is basically all the relationships that lies outside class 2A in which basically a claimant have already placed trust and confidence in the defendant and it is necessary for the claimant to establish that the defendant has actually acquired influence over the claimant in relation to some ex general aspect of this affair according to the case of Morley and Emily. This class here is to determine that if there is sufficient trust and confidence placed by the claimant to on the defendant, there is still a slight chance of possibility to set the transaction aside. For example, it will be a case of customer and a bank. If the claimant in the case is able to show there was a trust, sufficient trust and confidence placed into the relationship and the transaction is the one that calls off for an explanation, then they will be able to set it aside on the ground of undue influence if the courts decide so based on the case of evidence. This is affirmed in the case of Lloyd Bank Limited and Party. However, all those are just presumption and a presumption can be rebutted if the party is benefiting from the transaction shows that the transaction was exercised freely by its own independent will. For example, in the case of all card and skinnier, the court set aside the voluntary the voluntary gift unless it is proof that in fact the gift is a spontaneous act of the donor under circumstances which enabled him to exercise an independent will and which 
justifies the court in holding that the gift was the result of a free exercise of the donor will. And the most usual way to rebut it is to show that the victim already had an independent advice from the third party. But however again, the independent advice does not necessarily would rebut that presumption. It lies between a question of fact, where every case would be different. What would happen if undue influence is proven? There are remedies. The primary remedy for undue influence is the refusal of the court to enforce the agreement against the person influenced. This occurs when the person influenced refuses to perform and is sued on the contract and he set up undue influence as a defense to be free from these obligations under the contract. But however, sometimes when the person is influenced to take the initiative and seek rescission of the contract in court, in which case sometimes there are they are subjected to bars of these remedies. In Malaysia, undue influence is referred to in Section 16. It is a guideline for claims of undue influence. Under Section 16 of the Contracts Act, there are three sections. The first section, a contract is said to be induced by undue influence where the relations subsisting between the parties are such that one of the parties is in a position to dominate the will of the other. The second subsection, under section 16, it states that in particular, and without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing principle, a person is deemed to be in a position to dominate the will of another. A. Where he holds a real or apparent authority over the other, or where he stands in fiduciary relation to the other, or where he makes a contract with a person whose mental capacity is temporarily or permanently affected by reasons of age, mental. The third subsection under section 16, the first is where a person who is in a position to dominate the will of another enters into a contract with him and the transaction appears on the face of it or on the evidence adduced to be unconscionable, the burden of proving that the contract was not induced by undue influence shall lie upon the person who in a position to dominate the will of another. And B, nothing in this subsection shall affect section 111 under section 16, subsection 1. There are two requirements to be met before claiming for undue influence. First, one person must in must be in domination over the other. And the second, the domination of a person on the other must show unfair advantage towards the other person. An example of case which states the clear meaning of this Two requirements is in Pusaturai and Kanapa Chetia and others. It was held that mere influence will not determine if there is undue influence because the influence has to be undue for a successful claim under undue influence. In fact, on the case of Pusaturai and Kanapa Chetia and others, the appellant's uncle, his maternal uncles, influenced him to carry out a deed of sale. The Privy Council held that there was an unfair advantage, and this case was later used in the case of Saul Gek Biao and Chong Yu Wang and others. It's Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation and Sharikat United Leong Enterprise, Sandirian Berhad and another. Here, the second defendant signed a guarantee favouring the plaintiff, but he failed to claim. His claim was rejected by the High Court due to the fact that he failed to form and establish the requirement 
of proving the number of cases where the courts have considered whether a presumption of undue influence arises by some special relationships falling within section 16, subsection 2 are involved. For example, see the father and son. In Carl Trample and Carl Trample case, undue influence could be presumed under section 16, subsection 2a. All that needs to be shown is that one party here will of apparent authority over the other. In this case, the court held that it is not reasonably accounted for on the ground of relationship between the deceased and Chen Ponglo and his family. This case is similar to the English case, Connell Limited and Gallant. In Connell Limited and Gallant case, it was held that the bargain was a proper commercial bargain, in which the lenders had acted like ordinary commercial lenders and that the lender could not be expected to do more that properly and friendly point out to a guarantor the desirability of obtaining the independent advice and to require that the document to be executed in the presence of another. Secondly, the solicitor and the client. In Tara Rajanaratnam and Dato Jaginder Singh, a solicitor is a fiduciary to his client. This relationship imposes an obligation on the solicitor to act with strict fairness and towards his client, client. Presumption on the relationship of solicitor and client, there is no differences between English and Malaysian position. In Halifax Mortgage Services Limited and Steps Key, the solicitor was aware that loan will not be used for its purpose which result in collapse of Mr. Skeppy business. The court held that the solicitor owned a duty of confidentiality. Thirdly, the husband and wife. In public finance, Berhad and Libby Rubber Factory Syndrome Berhad, the husband and wife do not fall within the category of special relationship for the purpose of the law relating to undue influence. In such cases, the issue is whether a party seeking to enforce contract has knowledge or notice actual or constructive of the undue influence. This can be cited with the approval in the case of Barclays, Banks and Aubrey. Following English cases, the Malaysian courts have held that a husband and wife relationship does not give rise to a presumption of undue influence. This can be referred to the English cases Bank of Credit and Commerce International SA and Everty. However, there is a modern or liberal approach or statement of law can be found in Royal Bank of Scotland and Andrix and others appeal as in the ordinary cost of business, wife's guarantees of her husband's business debt is not to be regarded as a transaction and such transactions are not to be regarded as the evidence of exercising the undue influence. However, it is something to do with the case which calls for explanation. In the assistance of the trustee in Sawab and Hanim and Haji Abdullah case, the plaintiff's husband had transferred title to all his properties to his two brothers. When he passed away, the plaintiff claims that the contract was made under undue influence. The court held that the contract is void. The plaintiff shows to the court that she is in trustee beneficiary relationship with her in laws. Confidential relationship has existed between the two persons, automatically give rise to confidential obligation to the relationship itself. Another case relating to confidential relationship is the case of Rosli bin Darus and Mansour at Harun bin Hazza Sa'ad. The judge following the Indian case of Balo and Paraza ruled that it has been established that the defendants were in a position to dominate the plaintiff will and that the transaction was unconscionable. The burden of proof of absence of undue influence rested upon the defendants. They had to show that the transfer was perfectly fair and reasonable and that they had not taken advantage of the first defendant positions and to rebut the presumption that the, the transfer was procured by the exertions of the undue influence. There are a couple of distinctions between Malaysian and English law. The first is that in English law, a transaction needs to be called for an explanation before it is procured by undue influence. Whilst in Malaysian law, the transaction, in order to be procured by undue influence, must show a manifestation of disadvantage. Now, 
it should be noted that actually English law agreed with Malaysian law previously on the idea of manifesting disadvantage. As the law was changed and agreed in the National West Minister Ban PLC versus Morgan in 1985 case, where they completely abandoned Elkhart and Skinner idea of calling for an explanation in that case. However, this view was later doubted in the case of CIBC Mortgages PLC versus Pitt in 1944, especially on the grounds where A stood in a fiduciary position to B. It was also noted that in actual undue influence cases, the requirement of manifest disadvantage does not apply. And therefore, if the, actu if the actual undue influence does not apply, why should it apply to the presumed undue influence cases? So this can be seen in the case of Bank of Credit and Commerce SA versus Abudi in 1990. In the Etridge case, the use of the words manifest disadvantage was actually discouraged and the requirement was reinstated in the form that the transaction must be one which actually calls for an explanation before it can be procured by undue influence under the presumed undue influence act. And as stated, Malaysian law on undue influence uses the idea of manifesting disadvantage as they adopted the Indian case post Suturai vs. Kanapa Chetia in 1920. They followed, and this, this case actually stipulated that even if dominion is proved, the victim must go on to prove that the influencer had secured an unfair advantage, meaning that it had manifested disadvantage and not one which calls for an explanation simply. And this was adopted by Malaysia and it was actually followed in the case of Tengku Abdullah versus Muhammad Atif in 1996. Another distinction between Malaysian and English law is that it is not entirely clear whether the clear-cut distinction between actual and presumed influence found in the English law is actually applicable within the scope of Section 16 stipulated in the Contracts Act in Malaysian law. In the Indian case of Posuturai versus Kanapa Shatya in 1920, it was followed that the case, it, it was actually adopted in Malaysia in the case of um, Tengku Abdullah versus Muhammad Latif in 1996. And it followed that all three subsections in Section 16 proceeded on the basis of relations subsisting between the parties. But the distinction comes here. In English law, for actual undue influence, there did not be any pre-existing relationship. Or we can actually say that there is no, <coughs> there is no proof of any history of influence between the parties in the cases of actual undue influence. It can be argued though, it can be argued and said that in section 16 part 1 in Malaysian law, it deals with actual undue influence if we were to actually break down and consider the words relations subsisting between parties to mean relations subsisting between the parties having to regard to the actual circumstances subsisting between the parties at the time of the exercise of the alleged undue influence. In that way, we can stipulate that there is an essence of actual undue influence if the relations happen at that point of time. So the Malaysian courts have not placed too much emphasis on whether undue influence was actual or presumed. There is no clear-cut distinction as there is in English law, which has been adopted. They have generally adopted the position that Section 16 in substance is actually similar to where they actually adopted the Indian Contracts Act of 1872 and was passed, such as we have stated earlier, the post Turai versus Kanapia Chakya case, and the Tengku Abdullah versus Muhammad Nati case was a Malaysian case that actually adopted it. In most cases, although Section 16 of Contract Act embodied such express provision on undue influence, the law of undue influence as accepted by Malaysian court is basically a stem with the English court. So, for the conclusion for this presentation, I would like to mention that the differences and the similarities of undue influence under the English law and Malaysian law again. Similarly, there are a few of similarities. Firstly, 
The elements to be fulfilled to form undue influence is set in English law and Malaysian law. Secondly, for presumed undue influence, the existence of spatial relationship or fiduciary relationship and those categories of spatial relationship are not fixed in both jurisdictions. So, beside that, the way of rebutting presumption of undue influence is quite similar in English and Malaysian law. The last similarity that is the remedies will be provided by both court if the court decided not to enforce the agreement which infected by undue influence. Despite the undue influence in Malaysia is very similar with UK, but there are differences too. So in a class 2B in English law, the relation in trust and confidence must be generally acknowledged by both parties before a rebuttable presumption of undue influence arises for the issue. However, in Malaysian law, after the claimant proved that the existence of a relationship of trust and confidence, he or she also need to prove his or her will are dominating by the party imposing undue influence. The Malaysian court has generally adopted English principle of undue influence, but the ways that Malaysian court applying the principle are depending on the local circumstances, policy reason, and customs. Therefore, the application of the doctrine of undue influence in two jurisdictions is quite different. So, conclude that the court should square up various factors. For example, they should take up the nature of relationship as a whole and decide whether it's the transaction appropriate. And then secondly, they also need to take the claimant's intention and the behavior of the defendant into account instead of the rigid principles of pure reliance. Lastly, the court has to determine a balance between conflicting interests of both parties in order to make a fair and just decision.